Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture in which we're going to be talking about the brainstem in detail and we're also going to be introducing the anatomy of the cerebellum. However, we're going to have a dedicated lecture on the cerebellum later on. So the outline of today's lecture, we're first going to talk about the brainstem. We're going to talk about the general functions of the brainstem we're then going to look at the anatomical location and the relationships of the brainstem with other structures. We're going to be looking at the anatomical and functional subdivisions of the brainstem. Then we're going to look at the external features of the brainstem and some cranial nerves. Where do these cranial nerves emerge from in the brainstem? Then we'll associate that external anatomy with the internal anatomy of the brainstem by looking at cross sections. And then we'll finish off by looking at the cerebellum, the general functions and the gross anatomy of the cerebellum. So let's look at those functions of the cerebellum. So the cerebellum, sorry, <laughs> the brainstem, first starting with the brainstem. The brainstem can act as a conduit. So we're going to see that many ascending and descending pathways, which we refer to as those long tracts, they're going to pass through the brainstem as they take origin in either the higher centers in the brain going towards the spinal cord or as they take origin in the spinal cord going towards the centers of the brain. Some of these pathways can also take origin in the cerebellum or end in the cerebellum and as we'll see as we move on through the course there are specific nuclei in the brainstem. So some pathways can start in the brainstem itself or stop in the brainstem itself. The brainstem also has integrative functions. So one of the structures that we find in the brainstem is called the reticular formation. As we will see, the reticular formation is just a diffuse network of neurons that is not very um, anatomically defined. However, it has many functions. One of them is the control of consciousness and arousal. It also has many nuclei that uh, control our respiratory functions and our cardiovascular functions. And it exerts influence in how we perceive pain. So that diffuse network that spans the whole length of the brainstem has many functions. The brainstem itself can also influence motor patterns. So it's going to receive some motor information either from the spinal cord or from the cerebellum or from the cortex and it can modulate and influence that movement to make it more accurate and precise. And as we're going to see, the brainstem is quite important because it gives rise to the cranial nerves. So the cranial nerves are kind of like the head's equivalent to the spinal nerves, bringing many motor and sensory information. But these cranial nerves also bring special sensory information, such as sight, hearing, equilibrium, gustation, and um, olfaction, which hasn't been mentioned here. Cranial nerves are associated with cranial nerve nuclei, and these nuclei take place in the brainstem. And many nuclei of the brainstem are going to be important for many reflex functions. And we're going to discuss some specific reflex later on in the course. So let's look at the location and relationships of the brainstem. So we have here a cadaveric view of the head that has been cut in the midline, mid-sagittally. And we already know that the brainstem is composed of three portions, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. So let's put them here in the image. So the midbrain, highlighted in blue, is the rostral most portion of the brainstem and it's continuous with the diencephalon. So the diencephalon sits on top of the midbrain. The pons is below the midbrain and below the midbrain and below the pons, we have the medulla oblongata. So the medulla is the caudal most portion of the brainstem and is continuous with the spinal cord at the level of the foramen magnum. 
So this would be the foramen magnum here. That's the place where the spinal cord leaves. Ventrally, the brainstem is in contact with this area here. This is actually part of our occipital bone and it's called the clivus. And dorsally, the brainstem is related to the cerebellum. So let's look um, at these relationships of the brainstem in other views. So here we can see a ventral view. And again, we're seeing that mid-sagittal view. So in the ventral surface, we can only see a little bit of the midbrain. We can see the big pons and the medulla. And in the medial surface, again, we can see the midbrain, pons, and medulla. But what I want you to appreciate is that running through the brainstem, there are some components of the ventricular system, as we discussed in the ventricular system lecture. So we have the cerebral aqueduct at the level of the midbrain and the fourth ventricle between the pons medulla anteriorly and the cerebellum posteriorly. So here's the cerebral aqueduct and the fourth ventricle. So here we have a cartoon representation of that ventral view of the brain and brainstem. And we can see those cranial nerves but actually it is only 10 out of those 12 cranial nerves that arise from the brainstem and are part of the peripheral nervous system. So these 10 out of those 12 cranial nerves, part of the PNS, they have sensory and motor functions. So they can be uh, somatic sensory or visceral sensory, that would be part of the autonomic nervous system, and we can have somatic motor or visceral motor. In this slide we can see um, a summary of that development of the central nervous system from the primary vesicles to the secondary vesicles. I'm not going to go over this slide but I really want you to make sure that you know which primary and secondary brain vesicles give rise to the mature components of the brainstem. So you can go back to that pre-lecture one where we discuss in detail the development of the mature brain. Let's look at the internal structure of the brainstem. So here we have a lateral view and an associated cross section. So at any level of the brainstem, we can have, we can divide the brainstem into three areas. We have a tectum, a tegmentum and the basal area. So the tectum is the most dorsal area. It's also called the roof. And we generally say that the tectum is posterior to our ventricular system, which is here. The tegmentum is anterior to our ventricular system. And the basal area, as shown in red, is the most ventral part of that brainstem. So as we can see in the cross section, which has been made at the level of the midbrain, the tectum is behind the ventricular system, in this case, the cerebral aqueduct. The tegmentum is anterior. And then the basal brainstem, in this case, the basal area of the midbrain is the most ventral part. The area of the brainstem that has most significant tectum is actually the midbrain. The tegmentum is going to be very important, as in the tegmentum, we're going to find many of those cranial nerve nuclei, as well as some pathways that pass through the brainstem. The basal area, that area shown in red, is going to be the most important area where we're going to be finding some descending motor fibers. So these are fibers that start from the cortex and bring motor information down through the brainstem, either to the spinal cord or to the brainstem or to the cerebellum. So that is the basal area. So actually there is um, 
let me just go back to that one slide. There is a condition. I want the eraser. There is a condition called locked in syndrome, which is an area that uh, a condition that typically results from a stroke at the level of the pons. So those blood vessels that supply the pons anteriorly become affected. And the reason uh, it's called locked in syndrome, so remember this basal area of the pons, we're going to have many descending motor pathways. So any injury affecting that basal area are going to interfere with the motor information going to the parts of our body. So what happens in locked in syndrome? Well, patients cannot move their body, their limbs, their trunks, their arms. Many of the muscles of the face are also paralyzed. However, eye movements are intact, and that's because those muscles that uh, those nerves that are responsible for moving the muscles arise above the pons. These uh, people with locked in syndrome can breathe, and their heart is also function functioning perfectly fine, and that's because the tegmentum where we find these centers are is unaffected. Okay, I think you will talk about locked in syndrome in the brain death lecture. So what we're gonna do in order to start our discussion of the brainstem is that we're gonna move from the medulla, then we're gonna look at the pons, and then we're gonna look at the midbrain. So starting with the medulla, it's been highlighted here in yellow. Remember the medulla is below the pons. So we have here a ventral view and a dorsal view. The junction between the pons and the medulla is called the pontomedullary junction. Let's look at that ventral view of the medulla. We're gonna start defining specific areas, specific anatomical areas of the medulla. So we have a cartoon view on the left and a corresponding cadaveric image on the right. The first area we're gonna define is the midline in where we find the anterior median fissure. And lateral on either side to the anterior median fissure, we have a bump in the medulla called the pyramids, one on either side of the anterior median fissure. So these bumps in the brainstem, they, they exist because there is something underneath them, either white matter fibers or collections of cell bodies of neurons. So in this case, underlying the, the pyramids, what we have is a collection of white matter fibers, which are motor fibers coming from the cortex, and they're going to descend down the CNS. So many of these fibers are descending motor fibers underlying the pyramids and are going down from the cortex. We're going to see that just the actually interrupting that anterior median fissure, we have this area called the decusation of the fibers. This is some of the terminology I want us to start remembering. The term decusation means crossing over of fibers. So how do we actually move our body? So normally our, our brain, our cerebrum, starts a motor instruction and it's gonna send it through the brainstem to the spinal cord and to the part of the body that we want to move. But as we will learn later on, it is the opposite hemisphere, that opposite cerebral hemisphere that controls the contralateral part of the body. So the term contralateral means opposite to. So in order for our right hemisphere to control our left hand, the fibers coming from the right hemisphere need to cross the midline of the central nervous system at some point. This crossing over is going to happen at the decusation of the pyramids. So in this case, the fibers coming from the hemisphere on this side are coming over, they're coming through. We find those fibers at the level of the pyramids, and in order for them to 
go over to supply the opposite side of the body, they need to cross the midline. That crossing over happens at the decusation of the pyramids. Next, lateral to those pyramids, we're going to find another bump called the olives. So we do have another uh, sulcus or another groove between the pyramids and the olives, and that groove is called the anterolateral sulcus, separating the pyramids from those olives. The location of this sulcus is important because it marks the place where we find those fibers of cranial nerve number 12, the hypoglossal nerve. So hypoglossal nerve emerges at the medulla between the pyramids and the olives. We have another sulcus called the posterior lateral sulcus. So this is lateral to those olives. And this sulcus is important because that's where we find the location of cranial nerves 9, glossopharyngeal, 10, vagus, as well as cranial nerve number 11, that's spinal accessory nerve, some of those roots of that nerve we can see in that location. So this is another view of the same, but I have extra, I have uh, moved the label of cranial nerve 12 a little bit to the side so that we can really see how it emerges between the pyramids and the olives. And again, we can see that cranial, those cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11 emerging at the level of the posterior lateral sulcus. Okay, so now let's look at the dorsal view of the medulla. Again, we have a cartoon image with the corresponding cadaveric image. So this uh, space between the pons and the cerebellum that have been detached. So let's note that on the dorsal view, the cerebellum have been detached. So in that space where the cerebellum was, so let's take the cerebellum away and we're looking from behind. This area, this rhomboid area, is what we call the floor of the fourth ventricle also referred to as the rhomboid fossa because of its shape. So let's define some of those um, bumps and structures that we can see in the brainstem at the level of the medulla dorsally. So we have the posterior median fissure. Lateral to it, we have a little bump called the gracile fasciculus. Other textbooks call it the fasciculus gracilis. This fasciculus gracilis contains many white matter fibers traveling from the spinal cord and up towards the brainstem. Lateral to the gracile fasciculus, we have what's called the cuneate fasciculus, again containing white matter fibers. And these fasciculi they swell at the top, so we have a gracile tubercle at the very top of that gracile fasciculus and a cuneate tubercle at the level of that cuneate, at the ending of that cuneate fasciculus. So these two more prominent bumps, they're formed because underlying those white matter fibers, we're going to find nuclei, collections of cell bodies of neurons. So we're going to find a gracile nucleus underlying that gracile tubercle and a cuneate nucleus underlying that cuneate tubercle. These four structures, the gracile, cuneate, fasciculi, and tubercles, they are going to form parts of our ascending sensory pathway, bringing sensory information from the body up towards the brain, and this is how they're passing at the level of the medulla. So we're going to see that we can actually subdivide the medulla into two portions, the most rostral part of the medulla and the most caudal part of the medulla. So the rostral part of the medulla is also referred to as the open medulla. 
The reason it is called the open medulla is because behind we are at the level of the fourth ventricle. So in the rostral medulla, if we look at the back of it, we are still looking at the fourth ventricle. So if we look at the dorsal view here, at the green area corresponding to the rostral medulla, this is the area of the fourth ventricle. However, the caudal medulla, we were way below the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle has ended. At the, and the point where the fourth ventricle ends is called the obix. It marks the point where the fourth ventricle ends and it becomes continuous with the central canal. That central canal passing through the caudal or closed medulla and into the spinal cord. So whenever we make a cross section through the level of the caudal medulla, we're going to see that it's completely enclosed. So now we're going to start looking at those serial cross sections, starting with the medulla. So the numbers here correspond to the level of the cross section. And we're going to start relating that external anatomy and those bumps that we talked about to the internal anatomy. I must um, clarify at this point that the slices have been stained in a way that the white matter appears dark and the gray matter appears white. So I'm going to start by discussing the anatomy of the closed medulla. And as we can see, we have that central canal here in the middle. So we've formed a closed medulla. We have medul tissue of the medulla, anterior and posterior, all the way around. So if we orientate ourselves in the ventral aspect, we are going to see our pyramids. Remember, this is a bunch of descending motor fibers. And if we look at the dorsal aspect of the medulla, we can see those two bumps that we saw, the cuneate tubercle and the gray cell tubercle. So we know those cuneate and gray cell fascicles, they were composed of white matter fibers. But I told you that the tubercles are these bumps that are created because we have nuclei underlying them, which contain cell bodies. So at the level of the cuneate tubercle, we have a cuneate nucleus and at the level of the gray cell tubercle we also have what's called a gray cell nucleus. Let's look now at the open medulla, the rostral medulla and one of the most defining features of the open medulla is that well it's open dorsally to the fourth ventricle. So we don't have any tissue of the medulla posterior. We only see the fourth ventricle. Let's move over ventrally. We can see those pyramids still, those descending motor fibers. Lateral to those pyramids, we talked about the other bump called the olive. And the reason we have this bump, remember, we have these bumps because there's something underlying them. So this structure that looks like a squished paper bag is what we call the olivary nucleus. So that's how we distinguish these olives in a cross section. Since we're at the level of the um, medulla rostrally, we can start picking up a little bit of this inferior cerebellar peduncle, which we're going to describe later as a white matter collection of axons that connects the medulla to the cerebellum. Again, we can see the division between the tegmentum and the basal part of the medulla. So here we have a summary of the medulla, of what I've just talked about. Okay. Let's look at the pons now. So the pons is that middle aspect of the brainstem. So it is superior to the medulla 
So between the pons and the medulla, we have that pontomedullary junction. And between the pons and the midbrain above, we have what's called the pontomesencephalic junction. So again, we have a ventral surface and a dorsal surface. You can think of the pons as like a bridge. So pons actually means bridge. And it's a huge bridging structure that is going to bridge the two cerebellar hemispheres. So we're going to see how that we're going to have fibers from the cerebellum crossing over to one side and then to the other side. So that's why we see all of those um, fibers transversing the surface of the pons. So let's start with the ventral view of the pons. So one feature is this basilar groove in the very medial aspect of the pons. And that basilar groove, you can already assume that is the place where we're going to have that basilar artery. That's where the basilar artery is going to sit after it's uh, formed from those vertebral arteries. And we can see those transverse fibers that I was describing earlier that shoot from side to side of the cerebellar hemispheres. In the pons, in the very middle of the pons, we're going to see the cranial nerve number five. It's going to emerge at the level of the pons. And it has a motor root because we know that cranial nerve number five has certain motor functions. But it has a bigger sensory root because the trigeminal nerve is mainly sensory with a little motor component to some muscles. We're going to see cranial nerve number six emerge just lateral to the midline. And we're going to see this dotted area. That area is called the cerebellopontine angle. So that's the junction between the pons and the cerebellum, which has been removed. And in that region is where we're going to see cranial nerves 7 and 8 emerging from the brainstem. Let's look now at the dorsal view of the pons. So remember, behind the pons, we have this floor of the fourth ventricle. And the most prominent aspect of the dorsal view of the pons are those cerebellar peduncles, superior, middle, and inferior. These are the places where the cerebellum used to be attached. So here we see the cerebellum cut, but on the other side, the cerebellum has been removed. And these peduncles are the regions that were forming that attachment to the cerebellum. Ooh, there we go. The superior cerebellar peduncle attaches the cerebellum to the midbrain. The middle attaches the cerebellum to the pons and the inferior attaches the cerebellum to the medulla. Another uh, prominent aspect of the dorsal view is called this facial colliculus. So it is a bump. Remember these bumps. Uh, are external features that exist because we have something underlying them. So as we will see in the next slide, this facial colliculus is formed due to some fibers of the facial nerve. So here we have the pons in cross section. So again, we can see the caudal pons labeled as number three and the rostral pons labeled as number four. Let's start with the caudal pons. So in the caudal pons, well, both the rostral, mm, well, more the caudal, really. We can see the fourth ventricle at the back, which is what we're seeing here. We can see that groove for the basilar artery ventrally. We can see some of these transverse pontine fibers. And the pons also traveling up and down the pons in that basal region of the pons, we're going to see all of these fibers, which are called, which are part of those descending motor fibers coming from the cortex. 
Let's look now at the tegmentum of the pond, so that posterior aspect. Here we start picking up some of that middle cerebellar peduncle, and we're going to uh, find some cranial nerve nuclei. So this one, uh, let me change colors. This cranial nerve nucleus just here is the nucleus for cranial nerve number six, the abducens nerve. So that abducens nerve is gonna emerge, as we said, just on either side of the midline. But I wanted to discuss the facial colliculus. What was that facial colliculus? Well, let me change colors. So here we have the nucleus of the facial nerve. And some fibers of the nucleus of the facial nerve, they actually do something very interesting, and it's that they loop around the nucleus of the abducens nerve to emerge at that cerebellopontine angle. Those fibers of the facial nerve that loop around the abducens nerve are called the internal genou of the facial. Let me, that those fibers, that asterisk, is the internal genou of the facial. I'm going to move on to the rostral aspect of the pons. So that cross section was made very, very rostrally, almost in the junction with the midbrain. So we're picking up the cerebral aqueduct. We can see those transverse pontine fibers, very, very prominent, and they're actually interrupting a bit the path of the descending motor fibers that we had earlier on. So these descending motor fibers, they were more grouped up here, but then we're gonna start having interruptions, and then they're gonna regroup later down in the medulla at the level of the pyramid. And again, we can see that groove for the basilar artery. So here we have a summary of the pons. But what I wanted to show in this image is that superior cerebellar peduncle, which we're going to see that connects the midbrain to the cerebellum, it actually forms the roof of the fourth ventricle. Okay, so now the midbrain, that rostral most component, superior most component of the brain stem, highlighted here in blue. So we know we established already that it's subdivided from the pons by that pontomesencephalic junction. And again, we're going to look at the ventral aspects and the dorsal aspects. Let's start with the ventral view. So we mentioned earlier on that the midbrain is continuous rostrally with the diencephalon. So what we're seeing here in this light gray color are actually components of the diencephalon, these mammillary bodies, this pituitary stalk, the optic chiasma, optic tract. These are components of the diencephalon. The midbrain is here in blue. So this portion of the midbrain that we can see anteriorly, we call them the cerebral peduncles, also referred to as the cruz cerebri. So these cerebral peduncles are actually, again, a collection of descending fibers. A collection of fibers, mainly descending motor fibers coming from the cortex. The term cerebral peduncles means little feet, so feet of the cerebrum, basically. So in that space between the two cerebral peduncles, so we have one on the right, one on the left side, we have a space called the interpeduncular fossa. And emerging out of that interpeduncular fossa, so between the two peduncles, we have cranial nerve number three, that oculomotor nerve. 
As we will see later on, cranial nerve number four, the trochlear nerve, also emerges from the midbrain, but it actually emerges dorsally. And then it makes the, its way all around, kind of hugging the anterior aspect of the midbrain. So let's look now at that dorsal view. The most prominent um, feature of this dorsal view of the midbrain are these four paired bumps. These are called the colliculi. So we have two superior colliculi. This, um, that's a plural term. One is the superior colliculus. And we have two inferior colliculi. The superior colliculi are important for our visual system. Our inferior colliculi will become important when we are going to talk about our auditory system. These colliculi have a little projection, kind of like an arm extending from the colliculi to connect with the thalamus. So we're going to see that these projections are called the brachium. So remember from movement, brachium means arm. So it's like a little arm extending from either the inferior or the superior colliculi to connect with aspects of the thalamus. We can also note that cranial nerve number four, that trochlear nerve, how it really emerges from the dorsal view of the midbrain, and then it's gonna wrap all around to make its way anteriorly. Here we have a midbrain in cross section. And what are some of the important features of the midbrain? Well, I always say that the midbrain looks like the face of a Mickey Mouse upside down. So the cerebral peduncles are kind of like those ears of the Mickey Mouse. And then we can see the shape of the head of Mickey Mouse posteriorly. So the cerebral peduncles here, remember, they are composed of descending motor fibers on either side with that interpeduncular fossa in the middle. Posteriorly, we can see that tectum, that roof, and here we're at the level of the inferior colliculus. So the tectum is really formed by those colliculi. You see the cerebral aqueduct, so remember the tectum is posterior to the ventricular system. The tegmentum is that middle portion anterior to the ventricular system, and it's where we find many cranial nerve nuclei. In the case of the midbrain, one example is the nuclei for our cranial nerve number three, our oculomotor nerve. And these fibers that we can see here in black are actually the fibers of our cranial nerve number three, oculomotor nerve. You can also see them on the other side. Later on, we're gonna discuss that there is another area of the midbrain gray matter and it's this area here just posterior to the cerebral peduncles and in that area we're going to find many dopamine containing neurons and that area is called the substantia nigra so here again we have a summary of the midbrain and remember that the part of the ventricular system in the midbrain was the cerebral aqueduct and we have these superior and inferior colliculi in a sagittal section. Let's look now at that reticular formation. So this is usually a part of the brainstem that causes a lot of confusion and we're not going to get into very much detail about it. So most of what I want you to know about the reticular formation is summarized in this slide. So as we were mentioning earlier, it's a diffuse network of neurons within the tegmentum of the brainstem. It spans the length of the brainstem and even a little bit into the spinal cord, and it has many multiple functions. So there are many nuclei, many cell bodies, which we call the reticular nuclei, 
And these nuclei are going to give rise to one of the pathways we're going to discuss um, when we talk about pathways, which is called the reticulospinal tract. So this is an example of a pathway that starts in the brainstem and it's going to descend to the, uh, to the spinal cord to modify um, motor information. As we said earlier, we have centers for respiratory and cardiovascular control. And this particular formation includes, includes a system of neurons called what we call the ascending reticular activating system. So these series of neurons, they actually project to the brain, to the cortex itself. And what they do is that they play a role in consciousness and arousal. So if there is an injury to that part of the reticular system, then we get a coma. Reticular the reticular formation is also involved in pain modulation, in our sleep-wake cycles, and in our arousal. To finish off our discussion about the brainstem, I want to talk about the blood supply to the brainstem. So look how rich uh, the brainstem is in terms of blood supply. And we already talked about all of these blood vessels. So one of the ones I always point out to the students are some of those relationships between these blood vessels and the cranial nerves. So for instance, this ACA artery, anterior inferior cerebellar, artery is just over top of our cranial nerve number six, the abducens nerve. And I always like to say that the oculomotor nerve, so cranial nerve number three, is sandwiched between the superior cerebellar and the posterior cerebral arteries. So make sure you're aware of these blood vessels and how they also supply the brainstem. So here we can see those territories of the brainstem that are supplied by each of these vessels. So as we talked about the territories in the cerebrum, I also want you to be aware of the territories in the, that are supplied by these arteries in the uh, brainstem. Because again, if we have an injury, an occlusion, a hemorrhage to these vessels, uh, at the level of the brainstem, then we're gonna have starting some, we're gonna start having some deficits. So we can see that, um, for example, in the medulla, the most anterior portions of the medulla are supplied by some branches of those anterior spinal arteries. A bit more laterally, we have those branches of the vertebral arteries actually. And posterior laterally in the medulla, we start having supply from the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So just a quick review of the cranial nerves that we've talked about so far and where they're located. So we have oculomotor between those cerebral peduncles of the midbrain, the trigeminal, big nerve in the middle of the pons, abducens in that pontomedullary junction, facial and vestibulocochlear at the level of the cerebellopontine angle, glossopharyngeal, vagus and accessory, they emerge lateral to those olives, and hypoglossal emerges between the pyramids and the olives. A question to, for you to think about in your own time, a couple of questions. Which cranial nerves are present in this image and which ones are missing? Where do all of these nerves originate from? So you can pause this video now if you want to take a break and absorb the, all the information about the brainstem. But I'm gonna move on now to talk about the cerebellum. Very briefly, as we will have a dedicated lecture of the cerebellum later on. So where is the cerebellum located and what is its major role? So 
The term cerebellum actually means little brain, and it is primarily involved in coordination of movement, maintenance of balance and posture. So lesions of the cerebellum, injuries to the cerebellum, are going to cause loss of coordination in movement, loss of balance, problems maintaining balance and posture. They're also going to cause loss in muscle tone. So the cerebellum is found under the occipital lobes of the cerebral hemispheres. And they're actually dorsal, it's actually dorsal to the brainstem, as we can see. So what is attaching the cerebellum to the brainstem? The three paired cerebellar peduncles. So here we have a dorsal view of the brainstem and the ventral view of the cerebellum. So this is where the brainstem has been detached to the from the sorry <laughs> this is where the cerebellum has been detached from that posterior aspect of the brainstem and we can see where those uh, where that cut was made at the level of the peduncles so we can see our superior cerebellar peduncle again that part that connects to the midbrain the middle cerebellar peduncle is that part that connects the cerebellum to the pons and the inferior cerebellar peduncle connects the cerebellum to the medulla. Now we're going to be looking at some of those views and surfaces of the cerebellum. So when we talk about the dorsal surface or, or the dorsal view, which is also called sometimes the tentorial aspect, I'll uh, let you think why. The dorsal view is also called the tentorial surface. We're looking from up here. The ventral view of the cerebellum is actually as if we were looking through the fourth ventricle. So that view where we had those peduncles. And the inferior view is from below. Starting with the superior view. So the cerebellum also has hemispheres and lobes. So in this superior view, we can see in the cadaveric view how the midbrain is still attached. This Mickey Mouse, let me draw the Mickey Mouse. The ears and that face. So that's the midbrain. So the cerebellum has hemispheres and it has lobes. So this dotted line is the primary fissure which subdivides the anterior lobe in red from the posterior lobe. And separating those two hemispheres, we have a structure called the vermis in the middle. Don't worry about all the other labels. Let's look now at the inferior and the ventral surface. So in the inferior view, note that we're still having that brainstem attached, so we can see the pons and we can see the medulla. In the ventral view, the brainstem has been removed. That's why we expose the cerebellar peduncles. So remember, we have a hemisphere on each side with the vermis in the middle. And actually, we look at that. Um, ventral view, this area called the nodulus, it is an extension of the vermis that projects into the ventral view. So here we have the vermis in this cartoon image, and this is the nodulus, which is part of the vermis, but more ventrally. We have these two bumps called the tonsils. We can also see them here in the inferior view. And I want you to appreciate how the tonsils are just posterior to the medulla. So if we have a condition of increased intracranial pressure, these tonsils might herniate through the foramen magnum, and that's called a tonsillar herniation. But as the tonsils um, start herniating, they might compress 
the medulla and it is a very dangerous condition. We also have um, some anatomical areas called the flocculi or flocculus for singular, one on either uh, side, kind of, they're tucked just under the um, peduncle. So this is a flocculus and a flocculus here. And as soon as we see those flocculi, we can appreciate in the ventral uh, cartoon image that we've exposed another lobe. This is called the flocculonodular lobe formed by the two flocculi and the nodulus in the middle. So we had an anterior lobe subdivided from the posterior lobe by that primary fissure. And we have a flocular nodular lobe formed by the flocculus and the nodule, and it is found uh, at the level of this horizontal fissure. So that was all our discussion about the brainstem and cerebellum. I know it is a bit of a heavy lecture. So after attending this lecture, you should be able to locate and describe the external features of the brainstem. So here are listed. You should be able to locate the brainstem attachments of cranial nerves 3 to 12. Define in general terms what is meant by reticular formation and some of its roles. You should have a basic appreciation of the brainstem in transverse sections, but we'll come back to these later on in the course. And you should be able to describe the morphology of the cerebellum, focusing on these terms. Okay, so thank you for watching and I'm going to stop the recording now. See you soon.